God, we need you this morning. Lord, we need you to work. Lord, I pray that this morning you would, you would remind us of, of how big you are, how small we are, and who, who that you say we are. But I ask that you would take us deep, God, that you would take us um, to like a deep heart level that, that we maybe don't go um, in our everyday life and because that's where you do your work. You, you, you transform our hearts. And Lord, I feel like a lot of times I, I function like I need your help. Um, and Lord, we don't need your help. We, we need you to do everything. So Lord, this morning, would you do everything and would you do it in our hearts in a way that we, we don't walk out of here maybe knowing more knowledge, but we walk out of here with our hearts a little bit more like yours. Um, that's what we pray, and we know that only you can do that. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if, if you've been around for a couple weeks, you know that we're in this series called Unsinkable, um, and this is the last week of a four-week series, and um, we're doing it with Church United, and Church United is just kind of like a, a, a movement in South Florida of churches like Lincoln Arms. I, I was driving here this morning, and I drove past probably like six or eight churches. Like there, there's churches all over the place, and, and what Church United says is like, look, all these different individual churches are, are probably fighting a lot of the same battles. And so instead of us doing our own thing and our own little huddles, why don't we like link arms and fight those same battles like together? That's, that's the vision of Church United. And, and so this series, this four-week series, is on four sort of just foundational aspects of the Christian faith. Four foundational aspects. We heard um, about truth. We heard about God. We heard last week about the gospel, how the gospel is not like religion, how it's actually better than religion. Um, and so this week, we're finishing up with mission, the mission of the church, the mission of God's people. And everything, everything is in light of the gospel. Like everything is, well, because of Jesus, because of the gospel, who are we? What's God called us to do? What's the mission of the church? And this is our, this is our message for today, the mission of the church. And I, I'm part of a larger whole. This thing is bigger than me. This thing is bigger than the Avenue Church. This thing is bigger than the church in South Florida. I'm part of a larger whole, the capital C church. I probably should have made that actually a capital C. <laughs> that means that I'm part of the greatest mission on earth. The greatest mission on earth. That's what we are as the church. And so I quickly want to jump to um, a familiar passage, Matthew 28. Uh, this is the Great Commission, verses 19 through 20. It says this. This is Jesus talking to his disciples after he had been crucified, died, and rose again. Okay? Which is kind of a crazy context, right? And he's, he is alive now with his uh, disciples. They saw him be crucified and killed, and this is what he says to them. He's like, yo, this, this is your task. Because of everything you saw, so the same for us, because of like the gospel, everything we heard last week, this is now what you're called to do. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So if we, if we look at that idea of, of what it is to make disciples, that's the Great Commission. Jesus says, you know who I am, you know what I've done, now go and make disciples. I think there's two, there's two main aspects to making disciples. The first is evangelism. And, and that's simply sharing your faith. Like sharing what Jesus has done in your life, sharing who Jesus is with people who are outside the church, with people who don't know Jesus. It's crucial. It's crucial. Um, and, and that's like the nature of good news, right? We all have, you have your favorite restaurant, your favorite movie. Like it's not hard for us to share those things because the nature of good news is that it would be shared. And so we're called to share the good news of Christ. That's the first one is evangelism. So we're going to talk about for like most of the sermon today. We're going to talk about what evangelism is and how we do it. But that's not it. It's not like, yo, if I, if I get my friend to like pray the prayer, then they're in, they can chill, and we're good. Um, it's like, that's, that's, it's done, yes, but that's just the beginning of a process. That's the second point we call sanctification. Sanctification. And that, that is growing to be more and more like Christ as we walk with him, growing to be more gospel-saturated, like more be able to apply the gospel in our lives and other people's lives easier and easier as we walk with Jesus. That process is called sanctification. So if making disciples is, is evangelism, sharing the good news, and then being sanctified in Christ, I think I'm, that might be a good summary of what it means to, to make disciples. I want to share this, this statistic quickly. 
Um, I think it's on that next slide there. So of the, of the people in South Florida who would identify, like, check the box as Christians, 20, only 23% agreed strongly that they have a responsibility to evangelize. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. 23% of people have the understanding that I'm not responsible to evangelize. That's not true. That's, that's not what Jesus says in the Great Commission. We are. we are. We are called to share the good news of Christ with people who don't know it. That is a responsibility that each of us have. And so it's at, it's at this point uh, that I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop that train of thought for a second because um, I, I've been, I've grown up in church, been in church for uh, like most of my life, and I've heard a lot of messages on evangelism. Um, and here's sort of the way that goes. You like, you roll into church, you make it here, you're like, sweet, that's a win. Um, I got here. <laughs> this week was brutal, and I got here. And then somebody gets up, and they're like, hey, I know you got all kinds of problems. I know you're struggling, and, and you've got things that you're battling with and, and stuff in your family. And then you get to church, and we're like, and just don't remember, or remember, <laughs> that that you're supposed to evangelize and talk to your neighbor about Jesus, and you didn't do that this week. So, like, you better do it. <laughs> Jesus says to do it, you better do it, and you didn't do it this week, did you? <laughs> and so a lot of times, and, and mostly that's in how I receive that message, but I walk out of a service that, that's talking about evangelism, and it's like, oh, <laughs> man, I, I feel like I'm missing it. I feel like there's a box that I gotta check. I bet I gotta go have like a super weird conversation with my neighbor, I guess. <laughs> Jesus said to do it, so here we go. Like, he's gonna think I'm weird and I probably will too. <laughs> like, that, that's like my takeaway from a sermon about evangelism. And it, it leads me to like, it might lead me to obedience, but it's from like a guilty like, hey, do that because you're supposed to. And I just don't know that that's like what Jesus had in mind when he gave us the Great Commission. Um, I, think that, I think that something goes on in my heart that gets it wrong in, in that moment. And so I want to maybe talk about evangelism, under, understanding that like it's, it's true that we are called to do it. That, that's true. But what if we attack this from like a, a different perspective than like, hey, you, you better do it because you're supposed to. Um, that, that's sort of where I want to go this morning. I think there might be a better way to look at evangelism. I, I've, I've shared with you guys um, before sort of, sort of what the, the process of, of preaching is like for me. Uh, I would love to say that it's like, it's like super easy, man, and I'm so bold in my faith, and I'm so like secure in Christ that I just doesn't stress me out. I just preach the gospel because like, yeah, I'm a Christian man. <laughs> like, like, I would love to say that's what the process of preaching is like for me, but it's not. It's like, it, it feels like a war within me when I'm like getting ready to preach. If it's like the week of preaching. Because I, I know that like God's, God's given me this task of doing like this really spiritual thing in, in preaching his word. And I also know that I can't do it. <laughs> but I'm called to do it. And so there, there's like this tension inside of me and, and it feels like a roller coaster. Sometimes it's like, man, this is awesome. Like God's allowed me to do this. I, I'm, I'm, I am really excited to do this. Um, and then sometimes, man, I'll just share with you this week. Like uh, it, was, it was Thursday night on the, if it was a roller coaster, this was on a downswing. <laughs> and I just, I just started getting these like negative thoughts and I, I like just started, started to get like, bad self-talk that like wasn't putting me in a good spot and I was just like man what are you doing <laughs> like you're supposed to get up and preach a message like you're gonna get a microphone and tell people about God who are you like you you think you can do that you think you can you can preach the gospel you're you're called to do that I don't think so and get you're supposed to talk about evangelism <laughs> When's the last time you, you led somebody to Christ, hot shot? Like, this, <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm, I'm telling myself, and I'm just like, oh, man. I, the, word, the word that kept coming in my head was, like, inadequate. Inadequate, dude. You are inadequate. You can't do that. You can't do that. And so, you know, whatever. It is what it is. That's where I, <laughs> that's where I was Thursday night. Um, and so I, I get home late. And my wife has been sick this week, and so she, uh, she had taken a sick day. So she's, I get home, and she's, she's posted up, like, sick style. 
you know? She's like sitting there, got blankets and like tissues and Netflix and like she's, she's ready to go. And she's like, she's like, hey, how are you doing? And like, this probably wasn't the, the most like supportive husband moment for me. I was like, I'm sad. <laughs> but I was like, I was like, I don't know. Like I just, I was like, I feel like I'm just struggling like thinking about Sunday and I don't know. I just started kind of sharing with her what I just told you guys. And, and she like, she got after, she got on me. Like, <laughs> she, she gospeled me. And we need to gospel each other. And she gospeled me. She got, if you know Clara, she can get fired up. Um, she got fired up. She's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> She's sitting there sick, and I'm just sitting there like, hmm. <laughs> She's like, are you kidding me? That's what you're going to think? That, that's what you're going to tell yourself right now? You don't think that's what the enemy wants you to hear? That you don't think that's what the enemy wants you to, like, dwell on this week? That you're inadequate? What do you think, anybody is adequate? <laughs> and I'm, I'm being a little more aggressive than she actually was. But... <laughs> But she's reminded, she's like, no, you're, you're not adequate. And neither is anybody else that, that gets up to preach the gospel. That's, that's what makes the gospel beautiful. Like in Jesus, you are adequate. You are adequate in Christ. Not in yourself, not in your resume. You're adequate in Christ's resume to do what he's called you to do. And so she, she gospeled me big time in that moment. But, but here, here's why I share that, because the, the, the idea of preaching is like, Man, it's a, it's a spiritual thing that, that I can't make happen, but that God needs to work. And as we talk about evangelism, it's exactly the same thing. It's a deeply, deeply spiritual task that we've been given to share the gospel with other people. And it's actually a task that we can't do. And so what do we do with that? And so instead of today talking about like tips and tricks to, to have weird conversations with your neighbors, um, I thought like, man, what if we... What if we maybe looked at, the, at our heart a little bit more and maybe like if Jesus didn't want his church to be like guilty, awkward gospel sharers. Like maybe, maybe that's the wrong source for this thing to come through, come from. And so I want to touch quickly on, on, on what I think maybe one of the problems with evangelism is. The problem with evangelism. I think we forget actually what happens spiritually in evangelism. Like I said, man, this is a deeply, deeply spiritual task. And, and the, the excuses, the problems that we face is we take this spiritual task that Jesus has given us and then we come to the table with like all these natural excuses. Like, yo, I can't, sh I can't share my faith with like my, my uncle, my cousin, my, my coworker. Like, I can't do that because I'm not like smart enough. I can't do that. I'm not like a people person. Yo, I don't even want to talk to people. Far less go talk to them about God. Like, no way. <laughs> That's not me. Or like, I'm not, I'm not Tim Keller. I don't know what to say. Like, what if he fires me back a question that I don't even know? We, we come at this spiritual problem with all of our natural reasons why we are inadequate. And that's actually not the worst place to start. Because the truth is, like I said, we... We can't do it. The Bible talks about people who are outside of Christ, and it, 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 uses, words, it uses words like blind, like dead, lost, deaf, because it's describing a spiritual reality of someone's heart who is outside of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, the natural person, someone who doesn't have Jesus, the natural person does not ac accept the things of God. Why? Because they weren't explained in a, in a relevant way? No. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because those things are spiritually discerned. And they're spiritually turned off. Like a heart outside of Jesus is spiritually turned off. Ephesians 2 says you're dead and your trespasses, and your sins outside of Christ. So what, what is man's heart naturally? It's spiritually dead. There's, there's this story of a, um, like a, a Bible college professor. He's, a, he's a, a preaching professor. And so on the first day of preaching class, he, he loads his class up and he takes them to the local graveyard, the local cemetery. He says, all right, guys, um, not looking for anything crazy today. Um, we're just trying to get one, just trying to get one. Um, you're going to get up and you're going you're to stand on this little platform and you're going to look out over this graveyard and you're going to preach your heart out. And we're not, and everybody doesn't have to get saved. I just, wanna, I just want you to get one person saved. 
And so he, they get up and they preach and they like fumble through, talk about Jesus or whatever. And, and what he was trying to communicate was that, look, you don't have the ability. You could preach the best sermon ever. We talk about evangelism. You could be Ravi Zacharias. The, like, you could have the most brilliant mind, and, and that in itself is not what's going to change somebody's heart because their heart is dead. What he was trying to explain was if we attack this spiritual task with just some really good natural game plans, then it's hopeless. It's hopeless. And so we're talking about mission, right? Part of the mission of the church is to evangelize. Well, that mission is impossible. Oh, got him. <laughs> I not, I don't, I'm not even going to talk about mission impossible. I just, I was typing it and I typed mission impossible. I was like, oh, I got to show a mission impossible. So I'm not talking about him, but I just, you can't say that and not show that. So the mission of the church in and of ourselves is actually impossible for us to do. Because that lost person you know, their dead heart doesn't need to be convinced. Their dead heart needs to be made alive. Their dead heart doesn't need to be convinced. It needs to be made alive. And when we recognize that we're powerless to do that, that's the best place to start for evangelism. So Acts, Acts 1, uh, verse 4 says this. So, so the Great Commission is given at the end... Um, of the Gospel of Matthew. And then, and then Acts picks up, sort of like continues the story a little bit. It's like, the, the, like what Jesus does after he rises from the dead. And so he's again with his disciples and he says this. And while, and while staying with them, this is Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. Which I'm going to stop right there. He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. He had already given them the job. He already said, hey, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them, baptizing them, all that stuff. Like, they knew the task. They had seen Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They saw him be crucified, and they saw him raised from the dead. They touched his hands. They had seen this thing. They had some really good gospel training because they saw it. They knew the job. But he said, do not depart or he told them not to depart from Jerusalem. He told them to wait. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I didn't actually know this before I got ready for the sermon, that, that he told, like he gave them the Great Commission, and then we think like, and they're off. Like, go do it. Go make the church. And he, he gave them the task, and then he said, Hold up for a few days because you're not ready. You're not ready. They knew the content. They knew the job. One commentator said, Jesus knew that they really could do nothing effective for the kingdom of God until the Spirit came. You know what to say. You know who to say it to. But you don't have the power to make it happen. It goes on. Acts, Acts 1.8 says this. Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. He, he says you, you will. When? Not when you have the greatest strategy or the greatest like three circle gospel thing, like that's good, but that's not what's gonna do it. Like when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and then he says when that happens, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses. He's not, he's not begging them. He's not pleading with them. He's, he's not asking them. He's not reminding them like, hey, there's this box over here that you haven't done yet. Like, you better remember if you're going to be a good Christian. He's just saying, no, this is what's going to happen. My Holy Spirit is going to like invade your heart and then you're going to be like this. So it seems like being a witness is, is more like a result of being filled with the Spirit than like a, like a guilty task that maybe we treat it like. Because when our hearts are oriented to the gospel, everything else flows from that. It, it, it's, it's like it all comes down to, to the work of God on lost people's hearts. And, and the Bible says that like we're actually all sinners. We're all born sinners. And so the, like if 
If you're a sinner, you, you've sinned against the holy God, which is, which is all of us, and so the punishment that is coming for that is death. It's like a physical death, but like an, an eternal separation from God, an eternal death in hell. That's, that's, that's what the Bible says, and, and we are all sinners. And, and we justly deserve that death because we've earned it. And like the harsh reality is no matter how nice a person is or loving a person may be or kind, like that's, that's not the way it works. That's, that's not what, what gains us the favor of God. It's having a dead heart made alive by Jesus is what does that. And so I, I think, man, I think that we really forget the spiritual reality of like our friends, our family, our coworkers, our neighbors, whatever it is. Like, like those people are, are lost and dead and blind spiritually without Christ and they're heading for like an eternal death. Like we, we forget that. We forget that reality. And we're, we're constantly surrounded by these people and, and somehow, like our hearts aren't burdened for that. Somehow our hearts think that other things are more important. And thank God that's not the end of the story, right? Jesus comes and Jesus, Jesus lives the perfect life that you and I couldn't live. And he never sinned. He, he never did that. He never gained that status of sinner. So, so he didn't deserve the punishment of death. But when, he, but when he comes, he lives a perfect life. And then he like inherits the punishment of death. He says, like, I'll, I'll, I'll take that on me. I'll take your sin, past, present, future. I'll put it on me. And the punishment is death. The penalty is death. I'll pay for that. And he pays for it on the cross. The wrath of God is like poured out on Jesus on the cross. And he dies. Like he's, he's dead for three days. And then, and then he rises from the dead because he's stronger than sin and death. And that makes him a sin conqueror. And check this out. That makes him somebody who can take dead things and then make them alive. That's who Jesus is. He's the person who can take a dead thing and make it alive, not you. We're just the dead things that came to life because of him. That's really significant for what we're talking about today. At, at salvation, like you put your faith and trust in Christ, you recognize that I, I did nothing to deserve this. I actually like did everything I shouldn't have done to deserve the wrong thing, and Christ, Christ like took my place. He, I put my faith and trust in him, and, and the Bible says that that presence of God, that Holy Spirit, is then put inside of your heart. You receive the perfection, the righteousness of Christ. When God looks on you, he no longer sees like your status of that, that's like a, a, a sinner who's far from me. He sees, he sees Jesus' life that he lived, his righteousness on you, and he calls you a son, he calls you a daughter. In the same way that he would like be pleased with his son Jesus, like when he looks on you, he's, he's pleased in you. Not because you earned it, because Jesus earned it and offers it to you. That's called grace. That's, that's what Jesus does. And then like that, that Holy Spirit begins to live inside of you. Begins to change you, begins to change your heart. It's all about having a heart that is made alive in Christ. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's like role is, is to make much of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's role is to make Jesus famous in your heart, in your life. So if, if something makes Jesus famous, that seems like the work of the Holy Spirit to me. And so at salvation, that, that Holy Spirit, that presence of God is actually put in our sinful hearts. And then we see like, in the New Testament, Paul also prays that like we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like we're given the Holy Spirit, but there, it seems like there's this abundance of ho the Holy Spirit, like a, a filling of the Holy Spirit that can happen. And so man, if we talk about evangelism and this deeply spiritual task that God's given us to do, that's the strategy. I, I need more of that. I need the Holy Spirit to drive this thing, to start it, to do it in the middle, and to finish it. Like, I, that, that is what I need. I had this thought, and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, it's just, a, it's just a thought. We can go into like a different category here. I just thought this. Um, 
Like, why did, why did God give us the Great Commission? Like, it's, it's, it's for sure not because he needs us to get it done. Like, if I was God, I wouldn't have given me this task. <laughs> and not you guys either. Sorry. <laughs> like, it, why, why would he choose to do this work through us? If he, if he just wanted it to be done, he'd just, he just say it and it'd be done. But, but God loves to work through our brokenness, through our broken hearts, to accomplish his purposes. And so, like, it, it, it's probably safe to say that there's a lot of, like, good heart transformation that God does in us and through us as we share the good news. I just, I think that. So, going back. I, I want to be clear about something here. Um, we talk about salvation, and I, I want to touch on that salvation and sanctification thing again real quick, because once you're saved, like, your status is secure. You're, like I said, God, God sees you as whole, as, like, righteous son, daughter. That's secure. Like, that's, there's nothing you can do to change that, and that's really good news. But then, that's also, like I said, what, what begins this process of being sanctified, sanctification. And, and that process is actually, most of the time, really slow. That's that Holy Spirit inside of you and your sinful heart, like, doing war all day, every day. And it's like, man, the more you let that Spirit win, the more you live in the Spirit, you begin to be sanctified. And we gotta wrestle with that. that that's where we go to war. So, so, so look at this. Let, let's think about, like, our hearts with the Holy Spirit and our, and our sinfulness going to war over this thing called evangelism. I think that a heart, um, you can hit that next slide, a heart that is being transformed, like a heart that's being sanctified, that is in process by the Holy Spirit, is one that has like a growing desire for lost people to know the love of Jesus. And so let's back out a little bit. If I, if I, if I think about the guilt that I experience when I come to church and somebody's like, hey, you haven't checked the evangelism box in a while, buddy. <laughs> like, I, then I'm like, oh man, I'm, all right, I'll do it. I'll, I'll just do it. I'll have a weird conversation. <laughs> like, instead, what if I recognize like, Lord, I, <laughs> I don't have a burden for lost people all the time. My heart isn't fully transformed yet. I'm pretty far back on this sanctification thing because if, if my job is to share the gospel, like, and my heart is being transformed, it needs a lot of transforming because I'm, I'm walking around with, like, a burden for me and my stuff and what I got going on. And, and your heart seems to be burdened for other stuff, so, so this, this thing needs to start at the heart level. Because if, Jesus, if, if your heart really loves lost people and my heart loves me, I think I lived with my heart more than yours this week. That's, I think, the solution to, like, why I didn't share the gospel. Not that I, I need to watch more YouTube videos about how to do it. It's like, I, I, I need my heart to get close to Jesus' heart and let his start changing mine. Because if I'm not sharing the gospel, I'm operating from my heart. I'm pretty far back, maybe, on that sanctification thing that I got to go to war with. This thing starts at the heart level. And so a, a, a helpful way that I kind of I can think through this is, um, you hit that next slide, I think there's, there's three areas that, that we can sort of address the reality of the fact that our, our hearts aren't perfect yet. We don't, we don't always operate with our new, like, Holy Spirit guide. <laughs> Sometimes we do, but, I, man, I want to live there more than I do because, like I shared with you guys, I, I live in my sinfulness a lot of the time. So I think three helpful ways to, to think through that process. Gospel-centered mission is rooted in proximity, perspective, and obedience. Here's what I mean when I say proximity. I mean proximity to Jesus. This is, this is something that um, Casey has encouraged me in doing, and it's been like, it's been an amazing thing for me. It's one of those things that God has taught me that I already knew. Um, that, that I need proximity to Jesus, because that's where the heart thing changes is when I get close to Jesus. And we get that a lot of ways, man. We get that through spending time in prayer, through spending time in the word, through worship, through fasting. Like there's a long list of ways that we can get proximity 
to Jesus. But if we believe that Jesus draws us and transforms us and changes us on the heart level and not the behavior level, then when it comes to evangelism, we got to go way backwards to the heart level at what's going on inside of me. We have to get proximity to Jesus. We have to get proximity to Jesus. Why? Um, John 15, I, used, I would say for a while, this is like becoming my favorite passage of Scripture. It's done. <laughs> it has ascended. This is my favorite part of Scripture. I feel like I'm brought back to this all the time. All the time. Jesus says this, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. That's what we've been talking about all morning. We have no power spiritually to do the spiritual things of God. We cannot bear fruit by ourselves unless we abide in the vine. Jesus says, neither can you unless you abide in me. Get that next slide, please. Thank you. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, you want to bear fruit? You want to bear spiritual fruit? He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Spiritually speaking, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. So if evangelism is that spiritual fruit that we're talking about, we can't get it without getting close to Jesus. I, I don't know that as a follower of Christ, we are called to do anything before we abide in Jesus. I, I don't think we're supposed to do anything before we abide in Jesus because he certainly doesn't have us to be like a workforce. He has us as sons and daughters. So we've, we've got to abide in Jesus Christ. Jesus says you, you can't do anything unless you abide in me, remain in me, rest in me, let your heart be transformed in me. You, you want the heart of God to see, to see people the way that he does? Abide in me. You want to love lost people the way that Jesus' heart does? Abide in me. Man, man prayer, prayer is like a, the biggest one for me in that. Um, there's, this, there's this Tim Keller quote that uh, actually Brendan, Brendan Kirkland helps out with our, our uh, youth group and he, he preached this last Friday on, on prayer and it was like, it was awesome. And he used this Tim Keller quote. So I'm going to quote a quote. Uh, he said, your, your prayer life is the litmus test for your spiritual health. Your prayer life is the litmus test for your spiritual health, for like, for like how you are abiding. We've got to abide. We've got to, we've got to spend that time in prayer. And then as your heart begins to transform, as you begin to be sanctified, as you begin to be controlled more by Jesus' heart than yours, those prayers quickly turn like outward towards other people. Because that's, that's what Jesus does. We become less about me and more about other people. So take an inventory for a second. If your prayer life is the litmus test for your spiritual health, how healthy are you? How much are you abiding? And I don't say that to say like, man, because if it's not, you are the worst Christian ever. <laughs> but like, Yo, there, there's, there's, if it's not, if it's not healthy, then there's so much freedom waiting for you. Like, to, in walking with Jesus. There's so much good stuff ahead of you. If you're, if, if, like, that test result isn't awesome. Because as we walk with Jesus, we find freedom. And then as your prayer becomes like, Lord, I don't, I don't think my heart loves lost people. I want to love lost people. But I, I think I'm controlled more by my own sinful flesh than by your spirit. I don't want that to be the case. God, I, I want to be close to you. I want proximity to you. I want you to change the way that I see myself, the way that I see other people. Like as we pray that prayer, that's a really good prayer. Jesus says like, like hey, which, which one of you, if your son asked for bread, would like give him a stone? Like, wh like that's not what you do. That's not, that's not what you do. When, when your son, your daughter prays for something that's like, good and, and pleasing to you and your will. Like, you, you want to give that. And that's what Jesus is saying, is the heart of God is like, when you come to Jesus and you, you pray for him, you pray for his spirit, you pray for, for his heart, like, that, that's in the will of God. And, and the Bible says that he's, he's a good father who loves to give us good gifts that are in his will. So I think that's a powerful, powerful prayer. Proximity to the heart of God. Number two, perspective. 
This, these sort of go in order, like this comes out of proximity. As you get proximity to Jesus, your perspective, the lens with which you see everything, yourself, other people, your life, your job, your work, like the lens starts to change because the heart starts to change, and then you see things from like a, a gospel perspective. You begin to see more the reality of the situation that like, you know, my lost friends are really lost, and that burdens me. Not because I haven't checked the box, but because I, I, like my heart longs to see them know Jesus. That's a very different burden. That's like a gospel-centered burden. So this thing, this evangelism thing, man, it's not about recruiting. God doesn't need us to recruit. It's like a transformation thing. It's like a death to life thing. So proximity, perspective, and then it leads to number three is obedience. Hear this. Um, it, it does lead to obedience. It does. This is not like, hey man, you can just go like have your quiet time and then you're good. You don't have like, that, that's, that's not really what this means. This just means that like, hey, if we attack this evangelism thing from guilt or, or from like duty, it's not going to work. But if we attack it from a transformed heart, that's maybe like more gospel centered. And so like, we are called to share the gospel. You are called to do hard things. You are called to have awkward conversations. You are called to do things that are difficult in the name of Jesus. But, like, we're called to do that from a, a heart that's being made more like his. We are called to do this. And I think that maybe if, if we can look at our life and say, that's, that's not true of me, I'm not doing those things, it starts at that heart level. We are called to tell people with our words about Jesus. You should smile, and you should be nice, but nobody's ever asked me, like, why do you smile? I think we think that a lot of times, sometimes in the church, like, I'll just be really nice, and they'll wonder what's up with me. Maybe. If I was lost, I wouldn't want that to be the, I wouldn't want that to be the motivation. Like, we need to tell people the gospel. We need to tell people who Jesus is. And that starts it starts at the heart. And so here's the good news for today. The gospel's not stagnant. The church is not still. It's not quiet. It's on the move. We're part of the greatest mission on earth. God has chosen to use you in all your inadequacies. He's chosen to do that and, and like spread the gospel through you. And he's chosen to start that work by transforming your heart. So, so, man, we've got to get proximity to Jesus, which, which leads us to, like, having an eternal perspective, like a, a totally different lens on life because we've got a totally different heart. And that does lead us to the point of being obedient to the Great Commission, to being bold, to telling people about Jesus. Man, I think about Jesus before he went to the cross. Like, you guys probably heard, like, he, 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 had, a, he had a burden. Like, he was, a, he was fully human. And what did he do, man? He went and he got proximity to the Father. And he prayed, like, Lord, this, this seems really hard. And then as he got proximity to the Father, it, it changed his outlook because he said, you know what, God, not, not my will, but yours be done. And then what he did is he stepped out into obedience, into something that was really hard and hurt a lot and wasn't easy and comfortable. But he did it, and he did it for you, and he did it for me. So if you feel intimidated, and you feel unworthy, and you feel inadequate to do the things that God's called you to do, that's step one. <laughs> that's step one. That's a, that's a super gospel-centered place to start this thing. Because when we come to Jesus fully aware of our inadequacies, fully aware of like, the, that like, I can't do this thing. I don't have it all together. I'm barely keeping this thing alive. It feels like for me, there's no way I can go like try to give this thing to somebody else. When we come to Jesus fully aware that our tank is on E, that we bring nothing to the table, that's exactly where Jesus meets us. So come to him. Come to him on empty. Today we're gonna, um, we're gonna end our service with with communion. And that's, this is a, like a, it's a pretty cool picture of, of what it means to like come to Jesus on empty. 
realizing that, that we don't have it and that we need a transforming power for our heart that we don't have, that comes from him. So as we enter into a time of um, communion here, the Bible, the Bible calls us to like examine ourselves. It means kind of like to, to take that inventory. And man, maybe if those, if that prayer life or that abiding or, or that, that heart war thing is not really going the way that you'd like it to go, he says, come to, come to me. Come to me and I'll fill you because I'll give you my spirit. So we get, to, we get to practice like receiving a spiritual nourishment from Jesus almost this morning. And we, in doing this and taking communion, we, we look back to what Jesus has done, what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection. We look at what he's, what he's done in our lives, what he is doing, and we look forward to the fact that he's, he's coming again. Like he's coming back. And there are a couple elements. We're gonna take uh, bread and, and juice and that symbolizes the body and the blood of Christ, that was, his body was broken, his blood was shed on our behalf when we didn't deserve it. The Bible says that, that this time of communion is, is for those of us who put our faith and trust in Christ because it really doesn't, doesn't make much sense to like receive the body and blood of Christ if we haven't done that um, in our soul. And so if that's not you, um, if you haven't put your faith and trust in Christ, maybe just Maybe just sit and get, get alone with God and, and work through some of this stuff that we've been talking about. It also says that I mean, if your faith and trust is in Christ and you've, you've made peace with, with this sin over here and you like it and you're not willing to change it, then you need to examine that probably before we partake in this, in this meal together. Because there's a big difference in, in having sin and fighting sin and not liking it, which is where we all are, and then having sin that you're not willing to give up. Because Jesus died for it, to be put to death. And so if, if you're not willing to put it to death, then this meal wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. So the team's gonna play. Um, I think we're gonna have some people come and be ready to serve uh, this meal. There's a station up here, there's a station in the back. And I would encourage you to, to take a moment Take that inventory. Where's your heart? Where's Jesus working on you in your heart? What do you need to give up? Where do you need to come to him? Where do you need to come to him on empty? And then when you're ready, you can come and, and receive and um, take, the, take the bread and take the juice, take it back to your seat. And once everybody has it, um, I'll come back up and, and we'll, we'll eat and drink together. So take a moment um, and get along with God and, and Man, come to him on empty, because that's when he loves to fill us. And I'll come back up in a moment. behavior, God. We need you to change our hearts. So Lord, we thank you that when we come to you, Lord, you meet us, you transform us, you take our brokenness, and you make it beautiful. Lord, would you, would you transform us by your spirit to accomplish your mission for your glory through your power? May we just be used. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.